together with uh, Felix Ho. Hello, Felix. How are you? Thank you for having me. Uh, so we had a seminar uh, uh, two days before uh, with him, an EPO sorry, seminar. Um, and uh, Felix uh, gave us the opportunity to talk with him uh, about uh, who he is, his life, and some information about his work. So welcome to Greece. Thank you. I'm having a great time. I'm happy for that. So yes. what do you think uh, uh, about Thessaloniki? You saw a little bit? Yes. You liked it? A great city, a lot of culture, nice people, uh, nice weather. is is hot, but um, it is a different kind of heat from Belgium. Uh, Belgium, the same temperature, we were sweating a lot. And this year, I, I think you guys are the same. Uh, it's, it's very hot summer. Uh, but, but here, same temperature, but you can breathe and there's a little bit of sea breeze. It's, it's, it's nice. Maybe the humidity. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, do, do you like the food here? Love the food, and I, I hope I didn't put on too much weight. You would, you would. Um, so, uh, do you want to tell us uh, some things about yourself, like uh, uh, what are you doing right now? How old are you? Uh, where do you live? And things like that. So, I was born in Hong Kong in the 1977. So now I'm 41. Um, I lived in Hong Kong until I was 16 years old and then when I was 16 my parents sent me to Australia, to Melbourne for, for middle school and then university. Uh, in university I started dog sport, uh, really training a dog and then um, I lived in Australia for 11 years mm -hmm. and, and as I got more and more serious into dog sport and I, I got the opportunity to come to Europe and I've been living in Belgium since 2005. So um, I'm married, I'm ma my um, wife's name is Maggie, we have a boy, he is now 15 months old. I hope the best. Yes, um, and uh, I'm a professional dog trainer, um, but I do more than just training dogs. Um, I, I consider myself a, 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 a person working with dogs, uh, but a little bit more than training. You are into dogs and uh, you, do only, you, you are up to dogs only for a uh, for living? You don't do another job or something? No, this is, this is it. Okay, yes. and uh, so how you decided to uh, base your whole life in dogs? How did you start? So this comes a little bit from my dad, from my father. Uh, uh, my father is a musician mm -hmm. for traditional Chinese music and um, he started very young when he was a child just loving to play with Chinese instruments mm -hmm. and then he became so good and he was so passionate about it and it naturally became his occupation so because I, I my, my dad is not so interested in dogs and Ironically, I'm not so interested in music. Huh? Um, so my, my dad never forced me to, to play an instrument. He, yeah, he encouraged me and he tried to teach me, oh, but I was never interested. Uh, but since I was very young, three, four years old, I was always interested in animals. So when I was around seven, uh, because I'm the only child, my parents asked me, I think it was summer holiday, they asked me, hey, um, I, I was always, because I, I was the only child, I was always asking, and at that, at that age, I saw my classmates, they have brothers and sisters, so I asked them, oh, why I don't have a brother or sister? So because I was asking and asking, so they thought, oh, maybe it's good to get me a, a dog, a puppy. Huh? So they took me to, at that time it's called SPCA, uh, RSPCA in Hong Kong. Oh, and you had, but this time RSPCA in Hong yes, Kong? Yes, yes. So when I was seven, so that was in, in the early 80s, mid 80s. Eh? And uh, my, my dad spoke to the staff working there. And um, they said, yeah, you can select uh, in these uh, kennels, these uh, three, four young dogs. So there I selected a, a nice black and tan color puppy, six months old. And they told me, oh, that is a German Shepherd. So we took that puppy home. 
my parents were afraid of dogs uh, mm -hmm. and they had no idea how to raise a dog, how to feed the dog and in fact both my parents when they were children they got beaten by dogs so they had some kind of phobia mm -hmm. uh, so the whole night they fed the wrong thing to, to the puppy and the puppy was sick and diarrhea and vomiting and my parents were freaking out, oh this is worse than having a child so, so the next day they had to return the, the puppy back to RSPCA and I was crying a lot and maybe somehow that it made an impression on me and you know a child and for some children something that you can't have when you're at that age maybe some children just forget about it but not me it was very deep in me and I, I, I was thinking about it all the time uh, as I was growing up I want a dog, I want a dog and I want a dog and um, when I went to Australia I was, I was 16, I was in school I was living with uh, uh, a guardian and adults that was looking after yes, me yes, yes. Yeah? So, so one of them she had two dogs and, uh, but at that time I was very my interest was in martial art, you know, training in martial art. So I kind of forgot about all oh, dogs and that. And I was uh, training a lot in martial arts. But when I entered university, I studied biology. And um, then at that time, the, the fire about the dog kind of, this idea kind of came back to me. And uh, this was when I, I started training dogs and working with dogs. So going back to your question, why I became a pro trainer? Because um, as I was growing up, my father took his passion and made this his career. So I grew up uh, seeing him enjoying so much his work. So it is normal for me to... Uh, I did biology, so it had some relationship with dogs and and then um, my passion I then I realized is uh, keeping dogs training with dogs so it came very naturally to me in the middle of uh, my education in the university to become a professional dog trainer and yes since even before I graduated I started it so in Australia it was in Australia the yes. foundation of your career yeah. And uh, there you, you found a trainer, or how did you, and what was your first dog, for example? So, when I was in university, and to be honest, I did this biology course, they talk about dogs one day, uh, uh, a three or four years course, uh, one day they talked about dogs. So, I learned really nothing about training a dog and breeding a dog in university, but one of my Professors Richard, uh, he was a dog person and he had this uh, uh, Norwegian elk horn. Uh, I remember he telling me it's a rare breed. So, because he is a very good teacher uh, and, and he knew that I like dogs, so he always, always took me to the side and we were talking in his room about dogs and he was very uh, interested to hear what I had to say uh, because at that time I was already going to different dog schools so Richard, this uh, professor, he said to me hey, uh, yes you're having your university education with us now but don't limit yourself in this go out and explore because um, science is, is only a small part of the answers uh, mm, science cannot give you all the answers and, and sometimes you have to go out of this um, field of science to learn more and to explore and because of his encouragement I went to visit a lot of different dog schools and, and uh, different trainers uh, and then I, I my second dog, uh, my first dog, kind of my first dog was that young German Shepherd and, and then when I started again, I think it was about when I was 21, it was mm -hmm. 1999 You were still in Australia? Yes, yes So I was in university, but at that time I wanted to do some um, work experience mm -hmm. 
and I lived right next to Caulfield Race Course for horses, uh, horse okay. racing. So I thought, oh, I'm a biology student, I want to do some work in this while I'm in school. I called up uh, one of the trainers there and I said, oh, I'm in university, I do biology, can I come for one or two weeks working for you for free to gain some experience for my education? Yeah, yeah, why not, come. So I worked there and then after two weeks, uh, I took my shot, I asked the trainer, hey, can I work here while I go to school and work here permanently and become a, a, an actual staff? Yeah, we need people because uh, it's, it's a very tough industry for horses, they don't like the heat, you have to get up very early in the morning to work them. You, you, cannot, you cannot do this uh, in midday, uh, it, it's a mammal, uh, they don't like the heat. So I worked there while going to school for one year and um, uh, my trainer, the horse trainer, he had a Doberman uh, and I thought, oh, at that time I was living by myself in, a, in an apartment, I thought, hey, why, why wouldn't I have a dog also? And a friend of mine from, from martial arts, he had a, a husky cross Alaskan Malamute. Looks like a wolf and, and very powerful looking dog, but at the same time very friendly. So I had no idea about dogs and dog breeds. I just liked his dog and I said, okay, I will get a dog like him. Yeah? So I looked up the local um, uh, trading post, the newspapers, and I searched for a breeder. I went to this breeder and I bought a, a puppy, a Leskin Malamute puppy. Of course, I had no idea how to train him. I looked up Yellow Pages. I called up a dog school, a, a professional dog school, and they sent a trainer to me to teach me how to train the dog. Um, very old school, traditional methods with the choker chain, crank, crank, crank like this. And of course, I didn't know any better. I followed that. And she said to me, yeah, uh, use the choker chain and the leash and uh, apply pressure, you know, the old school thing. Bring the choker chain up and at the same time push the, the bum of the dog down to make him sit. Uh, the, the whole system like that. Not really a system, you know. And she said to me, yeah, don't use food uh, to train the dog. And I asked her why. She said to me, yeah, because uh, if you do this, then the dog works not for you, but for the food. But of course now I don't agree with that. Uh, but at that time I didn't know any better. I followed that. Uh, but after it was a five session course and every two weeks she came and to teach me something new. And then later on, you know, I just try. Uh, I, I didn't obey what she told me. Uh, I, I tried a little bit with food and I saw, oh, it works and, and the dog was not uh, having this um, submissive expression anymore when I was using food. So I, I changed a little bit uh, the, the things that she taught me. And then when she came for the last session, I showed her. And the dog was working a little bit happier and, and she agreed, oh, maybe uh, what you're doing is better. Yeah? But I, I saw that what she was teaching me was pretty basic and, and it was not, um, how should I say, some of the things has conflict uh, in my head. So I didn't go any further with, with this school. Uh, and, and that dog, uh, I turned out, it, turning out that this breed or this particular dog was not something that I wanted or I expected. So I called up the breeder and one of the problem was is a Malamute and normally they should look like a Malamute. But then when this puppy became a few months older, maybe eight, nine months or one year old, and he had big floppy ears like this. So I met another friend and it just happened that his mother is a, is a show judge for Alaska Malamute. So I show her the dog and, and she said to me, hey Felix, mm, this dog is uh, maybe is, is not pure, it's a crossbreed or even if it's pure breed, it's not uh, 
up to the the beauty standard. Uh? So I call up the breeder and I, I ask her, oh, is that possible? I give you back the, the dog and uh, to change for another one. Breeder said, yeah, okay, come back. So I took this dog, uh, Diesel, that was his name. I gave him back to the breeder. Breeder gave me a cousin of Diesel. And, and it's an older puppy, I think 11, 12 uh, weeks old. So I took him home. Now, Diesel was a very friendly, very stable dog, but uh, trainability not so high. But of course, it had to do with how I trained him also, uh, so I cannot blame the dog. Um, but he was very open. Uh, the first one, Diesel, he was, the, the whole race course knew him because he was hanging around the stables, but all the time he would just leave and, and walk the whole race course and sometimes other stables would call my trainer and say, hey, Diesel is here eating my cat's food. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so either me or my trainer had to go to pick him up. They were very friendly, everybody liked him. Uh, and the second one, Aman, uh, I gave the name, uh, he was quite timid, not so open, but a lot more intelligent. Uh, so again, after a few months, oh, I realized, oh, this dog is a little bit insecure. Eh? So I, I gave him to a, a friend of mine. That friend had dogs also. Uh, so he was living there happily with this friend. Okay. So I, I had no dog then, and I thought, oh, it's, it's a dog, it's an animal. And, and also, like a friend from the, from the race course, uh, an older lady, a horse trainer, she said, oh, Felix, this is not good. If you take a dog, it's for life, it's not good. You, you're changing dogs all the time. And I said to her, yeah, uh, when, when I take a dog, I, I have a purpose, you know? And, and um, if the dog cannot fulfill this purpose, it's, it's difficult for me to keep him. Yeah? So she was telling me off a bit, yeah? so, okay. Then, I thought about it also, so I thought mm, maybe if next time I take another dog, I have to be more careful and do some kind of selection. It's not good if I just take a puppy randomly, turn out I don't like him and give him away. It's not so nice, maybe. And one day I was just uh, walking around. I saw a pet shop. I went in there and there was a book. And this book changed my life. And this book was written by two Americans, Susan Barwick and Stuart Hilliard. The name is Shushun. I, I think uh, is then Shushun Principle and Training Methods, something like this. You can search it up. It's, for me, that is the Bible. Uh, so I looked at this book. I said, wow, Shushun, this is it. The, the, it's a working dog, and the dog has to do tracking and obedience and protection. I said, this is the ultimate. So I read this book, and it was a big inspiration for me. And then the, the book also explained, you know, the, the working breeds that people use for this sport, for Shushun. And meanwhile, in, in the gym, uh, I was training in, in Muay Thai at that moment. Uh, 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 one of the boys, he was into pit bulls. Uh, so he was always telling me, yeah, these uh, American people terriers, they're very intelligent and, and they're very tough and very courageous. So I thought, I want a pit bull. Huh? So again, I did a little bit of research. And at that time, the internet was just the beginning of the internet. Uh, that was 2000, something like that, uh, 2001. And, um, Anyway, I found this uh, American Pitbull Terry breeder and by that time I, I was already a little bit more educated because I read the book of Susan Barwick. So I, I read about puppy selection and, and what uh, Susan Barwick was telling how to select the puppy and the drive and the stability and, and the puppy should show stability and certain tests. So I spoke to the people breeder and just happened I was lucky I got the first choice of the litter. Yeah? They were only just born or 
very young, uh, two, three weeks old. So I said, hey, can I come and make the pick and uh, try to select the puppy that I want? Yeah, of course. But you have to do this when they're quite young because by seven weeks, uh, the, the second person that after you, he wants to take the puppy home at seven weeks. So you, have, you must make your choice when the puppy is uh, five or six weeks, something like this. Of course, now I don't do the evaluation when they're too young. Uh, I prefer to do it between seven to nine weeks. But at that time, he said, okay, five weeks, I will come and I will make the selection. So a small litter, I think, five puppies or so. And um, I tested them. I, I took a little towel and tried to make them bite. And one of these people puppies, a red one, all red, red hair, red um, amber color eyes and red nails. People, this is a very common color, a red nose, red, red. So with this one, I tested the, the siblings also also good drive and very stable but with this one i took a towel i made him bite oh he had a lot of drive to bite it and then i was i was banging on the floor and oh he was um, more dominant as i was doing it i said oh this is the one i want so i took him home and i tried to follow what the book was telling me and unlike the previous two dogs the the malamute Actually, I could achieve a little bit with the pit bull, of course, n comparing to what we know now, that was really ancient stuff. Eh? But I saw a development in, in the, um, what I have learned. So a little bit biting and a little bit obedience with food. And meanwhile, again, I looked up yellow pages for dogs too, because then I wanted to do shoes one. Eh? And I, I found this trainer, Mark Mari, that's his name. And, and, um, and also, I, I went there for training for the first time, I think, and Mark was explaining to me what Schuston is. In Australia? Yes, in Melbourne. Um, and um, he competed, he was also a decoy, and uh, for me, at that time, he was very experienced. And, and still now, I, have, I still have contact with him. Huh? So... Um, Either the first session or one of the very early sessions, Mark was teaching me what to do with my little people puppy, showing him how to bite. So I was in his indoor training center. Uh, he showed me, ah, Felix, now practice this. I will go to serve another client. I was playing with this dog. And before that, I saw this yellow dog behind the counter. Looks like a dango. I asked Mark, hey, you, what? You have a dango? And, and Mark said, uh, no, that's a Malinois. And of course, I have seen the name Malinois before. It's a French pronunciation. That's the origin because Malinois came from Belgium. Yeah? And in the book, I, when I read it, oh, Malinois, Malinois, I thought that is the name. So when he said Malinois, I didn't make the click. Yeah? So I thought, oh, what an ugly dog. Looks like a dango and she was jumping around, barking, okay. So I was playing with my pit bull, and when I was playing with the pit bull because I was making him bite, it excited the Malinois of Mark. She jumped over the counter, and then I just felt, just a yellow shadow, very fast, boom, like this. And then Mark saw it, and he was shouting at the dog, hey, Bess, that's the name of the dog, uh, Bess. So then she was under control, and I looked, and here I was bleeding, and Mark was freaking out, but she just kind of nipped me. Huh? And normally, a, a normal person is freaking out also, or got, it's not really bitten, just a little kiss, huh? and a little blood. A normal person would be freaking out. I looked at Mark, I said to him, Man, I want a dog like this! <laughs> so, Mark uh, said, Yeah, I got this dog from my friend Danny. He's a very well-known breeder. And also at that time, I realized with a pit bull, I cannot compete in Shushun. Uh, they had kind of, uh, with the media, they, they, they don't have such a, a nice reputation. So I said to Mark, 
okay, I will keep my people because I like him. I will not get rid of him. I like him. But I want a second dog, a Malinois. So Mark introduced me to Danny Yagodich. That's his name. And just happened that he was about to do a mating with, uh, with uh, this male and female that he owned. And these dogs were imported dogs from Holland, came PV title. Uh, and it was again something new for me. And um, from Danny, I got my first competition dog, uh, my first Malinois also. Is yeah, how old were you now, uh, back then? It was then 2002, so I was then 24, 25. Uh, I took this Malinois and the first year of his life, un until about his nine months old, uh, Danny was teaching me a lot, uh, how to train the dog. I, I was going to him once a week, but he lived quite far. And uh, because Danny, uh, he liked the KMPV program, but in Australia, there was no KMPV, it's only for Holland. So Danny said to me, hey, Felix, if you want to compete, uh, the only protection dog sport we have in Australia is Shusun. So I will send you to my friends, um, Chris and Jim, their, their experience in this program. What and was their full name? And actually, they're Greek guys. How about? Uh, Chris Kozopoulos, he has a Greek name, but uh, his heritage is Macedonian. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Jim, uh, his family name is Tokas, Jim is Greek, uh, so Chris and Jim, and, and they, they were best friends, they're still best friends, they are always training together, and they were professional trainers also. Now Chris is still a professional trainer, very successful. So Jim and Chris really took me under their wings, and, um, and at that time, because I'm, I'm a little bit of a, of a rebel, uh, if I follow a teacher and the teacher was teaching me something if even if he's right but if I don't understand it I, I kind of resisted a bit and I tried to find my own answers so they put a lot of time in me and and uh, they call me a knucklehead uh, because sometimes I, I was the doing stupid things and they, they had to try to fix the problems of the dog for me uh. But um, I, I could say Chris and Jim, uh, Mark, of course, Mark was, was a great teacher. Uh, he also uh, taught me how to start as a decoy. But the time I spent with Mark was quite short because uh, at that time, Mark had to move to another city very far. Australia is very big. Huh? So, but I was looked after. Mark sent me to Danny, and then Danny sent me to Chris and Jim. So I, I always had someone there, very experienced and nice, honest person to help me throughout my whole career. I'm lucky. Huh? So together with Chris and Jim, with this first Malinois of mine, Corvette, uh, we titled him. Uh, I handled the dog. They taught me how to train the dog. Chris was doing most of the, most of the bite work. Jim was teaching me a lot also in, in, at one time I lived together with Jim. So then we were driving, going everywhere. Then he was telling me a lot, not only about dog training, but, but in life, you know, so you, you grow as a person. And um, there were several seminars in, in Australia from um, foreign dog trainers, successful dog trainers. Uh, Lance Collins from Canada, mm -hmm. I, I have been to his seminar. Pat Brown John, also from Canada, used to be in the group with Lance. I went to her seminar. Haru Masuda, very well-known trainer from Japan. But it was Haru Masuda that I really clicked with. Uh, again, I'm lucky. I, I met him, he was giving a seminar, he was judging also, and there were a lot of people there, but he spent a lot of time with me, and, and I was always next to him asking, oh, how do, how do you do this, how do you do that, how do you do this? 
and he was very patient and he was telling me everything that he knew uh, and I, I think that because all the people all the teachers that I have met they were so open and and that has uh, a big influence on me that's why now when I try to present a, a seminar or when I try to help someone I follow their footsteps I, I try to be so open also and I don't hold back unless I think if what I say uh, will be difficult for the person to understand and because of what I say he may do something wrong uh, not intentionally to damage the dog then maybe those situation then I wait until the person is mentally ready otherwise I don't hold back I give everything um, and in the few days that I was together with Haru uh, in the seminar he, he, again, he gave me a lot of chances, putting on the sleeve with other dogs and helping and handling. And, and, uh, and then at one time at dinner, we were eating uh, and I was asking his life story and he was telling me about it. And he said, yes, Felix, if, if you want to really further your career in this, because I see you, you're crazy about this sport. You're very passionate. And, and uh, I think like with you, you know, I... I'm, I meet you and I spend five minutes with you. I know we're at the same wavelength. We speak the same language. You see this directly if you have the same passion. Huh? So he, he saw that in me and he said, if you want to go higher, you need to go to Europe. So I asked him, Europe is big. Where in Europe? He said, go to Belgium because that's where I did my apprenticeship. Uh, Haru Masuda said to me, so meanwhile I, I already graduated from university and uh, meanwhile the, the, my Australian visa because I was holding a student visa uh, it, it was uh, coming to the end and the immigration department said to me yeah if you want to stay here permanently you have to go back to Hong Kong to apply or you have to do another course I said hey but I'm a uh, I, I have a degree bachelor in biology and they said to me yeah but we we have already a lot of biologists we don't need more uh, go do a course in accounting or or IT and I must say I hate schools I hate studying I'm the kind of student that is always late or not going to school and sitting at the back and making joke uh? so you want me to do another course? No, man, I don't want it. So I want to come to Europe. So I, I telephoned Haru, hey, you have a, a lot of connections. Um, try to introduce me to someone. Haru said, oh, I have my good friend Johan Wackusen, and he's a professional dog trainer. And, and Johan is very well known. He's the breeder of Van der Duvetor. Kennel, very successful also the president of FMBB. So Harlow made a phone call to Johan, just saying, ah, Johan, my friend Felix from Australia, he wants to come to, uh, to uh, train dogs. Of course, Harlow didn't go into the full story about my full intention, really immigrating to Belgium. Eh? So Johan, Johan gets phone calls like this all the time. So Johan didn't make a big deal out of it. Johan said, oh, tell him to call me. So I called Johan. That was 2005. Yeah. And by that time, I, from an unknown dog handler, doing a lot of stupid things. And because with COVID, in, in, Earlier in his life, I did a lot of wrong things. I made him very aggressive for nothing, not social at all. And the first, one of the first seminars I went to was from, uh, from a judge from America. Floyd. Floyd Wilson, I think that is his name. Uh, and he was showing people how to track. I said, hey Floyd, can I take, my, take out my dog and make him track? But my dog was so aggressive. 
he came out and he was distracted and he wanted to bark at people and bite people. So Floyd said to me, hey man, this is not good. Your dog is out of control, is, is aggressive for nothing. So he was trying to help me. He was trying to teach me. So he said to the other guys, hey, take some food and, and uh, feed the dog of Felix. Corvette was then about one year. Mm -hmm. And I was very disrespectful because I was ignorant. I, I said to Floyd, no, no one feeds my dog. I, I'm the owner because I was afraid people will, can poison him. Not these guys, of course, but strangers because the dog is used to taking food from unknown people. So I said this and, and Floyd said, hey, go off, go off the field. So I walked off uh, and, and yeah, so came back to the clubhouse and of course I was then very ignorant. I, I had uh, Floyd there, really experienced in, in our sport in Shushan, a judge also, very well known in tracking. He was doing the right thing, trying to help me, and he saw the problem in my, in my dog. And I was disrespectful to him uh, because of this stupid idea I had in my head. So the, the, I came back to the clubhouse and people were whispering. But then Jim came in when, when I left. Uh, I went outside and Jim said to them, hey, maybe this young guy, he comes across uh, very stubborn and not listening and having his own ideas but I know him and he's a university student in biology uh, I know this is not someone stupid and I see uh, a future in him so he said to these guys and Jim said yeah let's see in time and I didn't disappoint him um, when Corvette became 18 months or, or quite young, before two years, I did my first trial in BH. I failed. <laughs> <laughs> so this was in Australia? Still. That was still in Australia. Huh? I failed because I, I was, I remember one of the guys said to me before I went onto the field, I said, hey, Felix, good luck. I said, I don't need it. I was so cocky. Eh? And in the dog did nice obedience. But then the long down, I didn't pay attention in the training. I said, oh, long down is easy. The dog got up and walked towards me. So I went to the dog, oh, finished. Eh? So I swallowed my humble pie. Yeah. Eh? Stupid and careless. So, okay, I learned my lesson a little bit. And then in Australia, again, this sport is, is, it has a very small population. And at that time, the whole year, maybe you have four or five trials. So just to get my BH the, for the second time, now the first time was in Victoria where I was living. The second time I had to fly from Melbourne to Gold Coast with my dog. But this time I passed, I got my BH. And then to get this IP1, I had to go again from Melbourne to, to uh, Gold Coast again for the national ch uh, championship in Australia for 2004. I failed again, tracking. Yeah? But obedience and protection dog did okay, but I failed. Eh? But then, okay, I learned my lesson in, in this, in, in obedience and tracking, and then I started to make my training more reliable. And then I got my IPO one again in, the, um, in Victoria, in this club, brought medals. And then my IPO two, not long after that. Mm -hmm. And then I failed my IPO three because the, the dog didn't out. But then I got my IPO three and then I started to beat guys that was, they were whispering in that room. Mm -hmm. uh, about one year later. So, at the beginning, these very experienced guys that looked down on me and thought I was an idiot, then I started to beat them time after time. And yeah, there was for a short time, very, you know, this competitiveness going on. And then they accepted it and they started to ask my opinion when they trained and they started to invite me 
to train together with them. So I, w I was very grateful for this, of course, because while you, these years of experience, you, just because I, I, I was uh, uh, an up and comer and won a few trials, I, I still had, could learn a lot from these guys uh, many years. So because they invited me to train with them, I saw how they train and I grow, of course, a lot also. Uh. So back to, uh, um, yeah, before we go back to Johan, then it was 2005 in the, in the national championship again. I did all right. I played second uh, with Corvette. The guy that came first was an imported dog. Mm -hmm. Guy tem came third also, but the guy that came third, he was, um, that dog was third in FCI, okay. World Championship. So he came just after me, so for me, I was, Happy. it was a good feeling. Hey, I beat the guy that, um, the, the dog that was third in, in FCI World Championship. So I, I was quite proud at that time. And with this kind of little experience, when I contacted Johan, because I knew, because before that, I tried to arrange to come to Europe, and then whoever I call and different kennels, they say, hey, we don't need an Australian Chinese boy to come working for us, and I have to pay him to, and to look after him, because we can, we can, in our area, in Belgium, Germany, we have a lot of dog trainers, and a lot of them want a job like this, yeah? So we don't need some young guys, Chinese, Australian, and trying to come, no, we don't need you. So, but then I called Johan, and Johan said to me on the phone, oh, uh, yeah, Felix, if you want to come to visit, you can, but uh, I, don't, I don't need anyone working for me, uh, because I, I have already enough people working in my kennels. But if, if you are serious about this, let's come and uh, we'll talk. And from that answer, he was being polite to reject me. I took this as a yes. As a, and then I told my mom and dad, yeah, uh, Johan from Belgium, offer me a job and I'll go to Belgium. I, little white lie I told my parents uh, so that they could let me go. I was then 27, 28, that was 2005. So because then I, I haven't, hadn't visited uh, Hong Kong again for a few years. So my mom said to me, hey, before you go to Europe, pay, pay, pay a visit. Yeah, come back home and, and, and see us and see the relatives and some friends. Because my intention is to, it was to come to Europe okay. to make a life, to, to immigrate. Mm -hmm. So, and while I was in Hong Kong, my mom said to me, hey, Haru, he helped you so much, go to Japan to visit him. So my, my mom sent me to Japan and, and uh, spent some time with Haru, very short time, one week or so. And then my mom came to join us and had a, a short holiday. Mm -hmm. When I was with Haru, I sent an email to Johan. Yes, Johan, I have booked my tickets. Now I'm with Haru in Japan. In November 2005, I will come to Belgium. So later on, Johan told me that, oh, he was surprised because he gets a lot of phone calls like this. Even now, people wanting to work for him. And, and uh, then one off, then you don't hear from them again. Uh, so I persisted and I said, so Johan repi replied back to me, yeah, okay, when you arrive, um, go to Ostender and then call me from Ostender and I will come pick you up. So I arrived. I won't go into all the details, otherwise the interview would be 10 hours yeah, long. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so I arrived and then, and then Johan saw me with these uh, so luggages like, like I was coming out of Syria. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, so Johan and, and his wife and his father thought, oh, what the hell does this guy want? Uh, we thought he wanted to come here to visit and look at how we train the dogs, but he has all these luggages. And then I went to the bank and I opened up an account. And, and Johan's father went with me. And uh, Albert, uh, that's the name of Johan's father. And he, he said to Johan, hey, 
I don't think Felix is only visiting for two weeks. <laughs> so then we had lunch and Johan took me into his office. He said this to me, word by word, and I answer word by word. This is, Johan likes to say this. So tell me the good news. Huh? So I explained to him, yes, I want to make a life here. I want to work for you. And um, uh, I want to stay here and learn from the best trainers because I know that Belgium in, in Schussen but also in ring sport with dogs as a general for me is one of the best countries. So Johan tried to be polite again. Yeah, uh, I, I don't need anyone to work for me. I appreciate this. And then I said, yeah, say no more. Uh, I, I just let me stay with you and, and just give me a, a bed to sleep in and give me a car to, to drive to the clubs and make an introduction. Johan said, are you crazy? I said, no, I'm, I'm for real, I'm serious. And I, I kind of touched him. Mm -hmm. uh, so he said, okay, you can stay. And he, he really looked after me. I, I, he's, he's a big benefactor for me. And it's a big part because of Johan, I make my life in Belgium. Uh, so that's, that's a, a long story short. That's, that's how I ended up in Europe. In, in Belgium? Yes. During your career, let's say, which are the people that really uh, you looked up as a mentor? So uh, I, I told you already, uh, I started with Mark and then Danny was the breeder of Corvette and, and um, Chris Kozopoulos, Jim Tokers. Uh, I spent with Chris and Jim three years. Mm -hmm. And I, I mean, not just like going to the club and, and train two days a week. Uh, no, they really took me under the wing. And every day I had private training. And they did it, never charged me a cent, uh, mm. Jim and Chris. Uh, so, of course, they, they had very deep influence in me. And then I came to Belgium and, and Johan really looked after me. Uh, of course, from Johan, I learned a lot also uh, um, about running a kennel and how to manage things. He's, he's a very organized person. And Johan made introduction for me to, to Julian Steenbeke, mm -hmm. Christoph Joris, and all, also Mario Verslieper. Yeah? Everybody in this sport knows Mario. Really big names. In yes, yes, and, and really dog people with a lot of wisdom and, and a lot of experience, practical experience and successful, you know. So I was um, introduced to the club, the IPO club in Ghent, OC Vlaanderen, mm -hmm. and that is the club I started my, my European career mm -hmm. with. And, and in that club, uh, Julian was, initially Mario was teaching me, and, and just looking at him train and, or with Yagas back then, it was, uh, how should I say? I was in awe when I saw this. Even, oh man, even now I talk about this, I have tears in my eyes. It was like, you cannot, uh, I was a little guy then, uh, and, and I saw this, giants in dog sports and and the the way he worked and together with Julian it was uh, like this. Like yes from someone that he comes from country like uh, China or Australia that Hong Kong. Hong Kong. I'm not I'm Chinese but oh, okay. I'm not from China, I'm okay. from Hong Kong. Okay, sorry. Uh, it's really like uh, deep, uh, swimming into the deep water, eh? Yeah. So straight, uh, when you go to Belgium and you're working with all of these, uh, let's say, legendary names in... Yeah, they're legends. Julian, Christoph, legend, and, and, and a lot of wisdom. Yes. So, these people that I, I met, uh, I, I, the dog people that I met in Australia, and then the dog people that I met in Europe, um, in, in Belgium, especially and even until now, currently, Julian Steinbeke and Christoph Joris, they, 
they have the most positive influence on me. But not only in dogs, as in life, they, I, I, I must say these two men, they are my family and also my lighthouses. Really? Yes. Some people are, they are really like, uh, and for me this is a little bit uh, a meaning of a mentor also. So it's not only about yeah, the, uh, they are. learning techniques from them or... Julian, dog, Julian like, is a father figure to yes, me yes. and Christoph is a big brother figure to me. Yeah. So for me, it's people that they they care and they care, and you learn from them ethics. You learn from them how to be with other people. You know. Yes. So it's all these things that it's often that it's much more interesting than the actual technique with training a dog or something. Yes. So, um, so a little bit in a few words. This was a little bit your story I'll tell today. Uh, so you traveled a lot. You made a big uh, life-changing uh, yeah. starts yeah. in your life. Uh, tell us a little bit about uh, the dogs you had and what you did with them. Okay. So my my um, I I've had a lot of dogs um, and I always raised them from puppies. But I only talk about the dogs that I have titled. Mm -hmm. uh, the first one was Corvette, Schwakung. Marco, that's his name, and with Corvette, I, when I came to Belgium, I, um, he stayed in Australia for, for several weeks, but I already organized that when I arrived in Belgium, he, he would be sent to Belgium mm -hmm. okay. to be with me, because I, I achieved already his IPO free, his, his Schusten free mm -hmm. uh, in, the, in Australia. So I wanted to continue with this dog. Uh, but of course, when I arrived in Belgium, I stayed with Johan, Dovetal Kennel. And Johan gave me a puppy as a present, and, and that is this dog, Eclipse van de Dovetal. So with, with uh, Corvette, I, I competed in my first trial in Belgium, in OC Vlaanderen. I, I won that first trial, so it was a good start. But of course, I, I had the help from, from, uh, from Johan, from Julian coaching me, from Mario then. Uh, so I, I made this because of the people, the team that is team. around me. Uh. So then with, uh, with Eclipse, um, I, with Corvette already I started working with the clicker, but later on in his life. So he had really no foundation and no system because I, I had no experience. And because I, I changed uh, in the circumstances, I changed from with Mark and then to Danny and then Chris and Jim. So the, the dog had a lot of different ways of learning in him. And, and sometimes it's uh, confusion. Huh? But with Eclipse, then already I, I read the book of Kevin Pryor, Don't Shoot the Dog, How to Use the Clicker. So with Eclipse, I started in the first year working uh, pretty much the, the obedience foundation with the clicker. Mm -hmm. and, and Julian was uh, telling me what to do. So with, with Corvette, we came to Europe, won the first club trial, and then I entered him into my um, first world championships, 2006 uh, FMBB in Hungary, and then FCI in the same year, it was in the Slovenia. Yeah? So, we did not bad. We ended up in the middle. Uh? Not very high points, but we passed everything in the middle. Okay. I realized I could not go further with this dog. Uh, again, other, some other people don't like it, but I, because I couldn't go further in my sporting career with Corvette, I, I wanted to someone that can appreciate his qualities to have him. Uh, Corvette then went to America. Uh, I, I think he was uh, certified as a police dog. I, I didn't do this, uh, the, new, the new owner did. Mm -hmm. uh, at that time he, he would be like, he was born in 2002. So he would be four years with an IPO free title. Uh, they certified him with a police dog certificate and he was uh, working in, in Arizona, in Scottsdale as, as um, in, in the emergency hospital as a security dog. Mm -hmm. 
and then the the new owner contacted me and and he said oh felix i appreciate this work is is a very nice dog and i'm very happy with him so i'm glad uh? and by then uh, eclipse was about one year uh? so then i i i work with eclipse and with a lot of help from julian um we we achieved some good things with uh, with eclipse and then after Eclipse, I, I had another dog from Johan, Jenkins van der Duvetol. Uh, I titled him in Mondial Ring 1. Just another sport because I, I like to learn uh, from, from different breeds, from different sports. So Corvette, Eclipse and Jenkins, all three of them are Malinois. Um, and they, these dogs, they in some period of time they overlap eh? I, I have them at the same period of time eh? uh, because I, I do this for work so I have my time is dedicated to this so I can if, if you have to work a, a normal job and also train a dog most people have one maximum two dogs but because I do this for my work and I love it so I can at the same time work two three dogs yeah like this so, uh, Jengis and then came uh, Bronco, Rises Bronco, the breeder is my friend Dr. Hammett Reiser, uh, he is a German Shepherd, with Bronco I achieved um, just IPO1, and then after Bronco I had um, at the same time Caro Duchango Magic, I, I did an IPO1 with him. Um, so then I had a little bit experience with Malinois, a little bit experience with German Shepherds. Thought, oh, they're both Shepherd breeds. Try something new again. Take a Molosa, take a Rottweiler. So then I, I took uh, this puppy, Jack from Heltover Forst, uh, two, uh, because there are two Jacks from, from, uh, the, from this kennel, from Paul Dieter Wehoff. He was my first Rottweiler. Uh, in world championship ranking, I achieved the highest with Jack. Uh, it was ninth in IFR uh, 2015 in Italy. Yeah? With, with Corvette was in the middle with Eclipse. The highest I think was uh, in FCI 19 and in FMBB 16. Yeah? And, and then we, we, we won one time the the Belgian winner, uh, the special, and another time, not the special, just the Belgian winner, uh, a CAC trial. So that was in 2009 with Eclipse, and those two trials kind of, um, I, I kind of proved myself a little bit to the Belgians, you know, because it, it was a very, those two trials were very competitive, uh, a lot of big names there, and in the, in the special in 2009, I think uh, I won by seven points or something from the oh. second guy. So, yeah, I, I, I made Julian very happy in that trial. Yeah. Um, after Jack, I had the uh, bad boy from Chapon Charlie, this dog, and, and um, I did IPO one with him. But uh, unfortunately, he has some problem with his heart. He died very young, two and a half, but very very brilliant dog with a lot of courage and very high trainability yeah, a lot of quality in this dog and so at the moment uh, do you train some dogs or what, you are, what kind of breed they are so i started with the malinois i'm back with the malinois uh, at the moment i have three young dogs they're one year uh, the bloodline came from christoph mm -hmm. uh, two males and a female and and so they're all brothers and sisters eh, from the same litter so with with uh, one of them ambush i am going in the direction of uh, of shusun of ipo uh, with the other brother assam i'm going in the direction of belgian ring uh, biting in the leg uh, with the female also belgian ring but because it's a female i might use her for breathing so i keep her a little bit as a breeding female, maybe, uh, depends how she develops, but also as a reserve, because what happened 
to a bad boy. He he died without any um. Yes. Uh, I, it, it just came. Uh, it, it, without any warning. Uh, it, it just happened. So and at that time I had only a bad boy as my competition dog. So I thought to myself, yeah, I will always have two free dogs at a similar level training at the same time so I don't have to wait one or two years before my next dog. Yeah. Uh, okay, I yeah. wish you the best yeah, thank for you. these dogs. So before we move a little bit in the, into the uh, tell me what, is, uh, what dog sport is for you? What does it mean? I mean, what is the spirit of yes. and what it is today? What was when you started and uh, what it should be if you think? Yes. yes. So, there are all different types of dog sports. You have Shushun, you have ring sports, camp, PV, but of course you have agility and obedience and, and um, frisbee, for example. Uh, um, of course, I, I respect all the training, all the disciplines. I like all breeds also. Uh, by, but my sports are sports that involve the protection part. Uh, so when I talk about dog sports now, I, I try to limit only to that because I, I also I have no experience in agility. Uh, so I, I cannot uh, say what, what my opinion is. At least I don't want to say this openly anyway. Uh, uh, so when I, in my view, uh, let's say protection dog sport uh, involve biting, for me is always maintaining the balance of the wildness and the tameness of the dog. What is wildness and what is tameness? Uh, Wildness is the power of the animal and, and the tameness is the control of the handler over this animal. If we want to be successful in... in and it, it doesn't matter if that is protection dog sport or police work or hunting um, or in the military security. When you bring out certain instincts of the dog, especially uh, hunt drive, prey drive, and, and protection drive, rank drive, when you bring those out, you always have to manage this balance because if the dog is too wild, for example, let's, let's not talk about protection dog uh, sports, let's talk about hunting, it's too wild. You, you set him free and the dog is searching for a pheasant. Yeah, his, his, his nose is telling him what to do and he's searching, searching, searching. Now it's going too far, you want to call him back and he keeps going and you lose the dog. Huh? So the wildness then is too high and no tameness, you can't control the dog, not good. But then you have too much control, now you say to the hunting dog, oh, go and search. No, he wants to hang around you and play with you, also not good. Huh? So if we use hunting dog as an example, it's like that. And in, in, the, um, in Shushun, in IPO, in, in, the, in ring sport, also you have a lot of exercises that demand this balance. For example, in Shushun, the dog has to bark in the high at the decoy. When you call him back, he has to come back. He has to bite the sleeve. When you say out, he has to out. And at the same time, you have tracking. The dog has to work alone. Uh, this is again working in the, in the instincts, hunting or exploring. Uh. But then you need also obedience. The dog has to walk next to you. And, and when you throw away a dumbbell, he has to bring it back. So this is always the, the balance. And sometimes, and also it goes with the age of the dog and the training level, sometimes you want the dog a little bit wilder. Sometimes you want him to be a little bit tamer. And then when you enter the competition, you want just this, just this. Uh? 
and it depends on the individual dog also some dogs for example they the the balance is they have some the base so so thick to support the balance so is is um it's easy to manage it but then some dogs the the base is like this oh then you're always struggling and and you're always walking on this thin line huh? and as a dog trainer the the fun but also the sometimes uh, the the problems is to manage this yeah it's a Sutsun training manual yes what is why it's not the EPO training manual so why you use uh, also during seminar or in our conversations you prefer to mention the this protection sport you prefer it more uh, as a Sutsun and less than EPO or okay. The next, the name that uh, we will have next year also. Yes, of of course, I don't have a problem with people calling the IPO or VPG or Shushun, but when I say the name of the sport, I I prefer I use IPO also, uh, but I I prefer to use the name Shushun for several reasons, because as you already knew and a, a lot of the viewers they know. Shushun was first developed by the captain Max von Stephanis mm -hmm. over a century ago for the German Shepherds. It, is a, it was a program to evaluate the breeding qualities of the German Shepherds. Yeah? And then um, over time, um, different kennel organizations they had uh, different regulations to, to try to offer this sport uh, not only for German Shepherds, not only for Germany, but to the world and they made another name, uh, IPO or International Proofons okay. Ornung, yes, yeah. see it's difficult uh, Schusshund is clear, it's German, Schuss is protect and Hun is dog so, this means something and if you if you google shushun it tells you very clearly what it is if you google ipo the first thing it comes up it has nothing to do with dogs it is the uh, initial public offer it has something to do with stock market and then they they uh, earlier on in germany they call this vpg and now next year they wanted to make a new name I think they will call it IGP. It's very confusing. And, and a lot of people, they try to be very politically correct. I think that is not necessary. Uh, and, and some people, the, the, maybe the room makers in kennel clubs, they, they try to make protection dog spot something that is appealing to the general public but this will not happen just like any sport not everybody likes tennis or football or boxing um, and a, a, a lot of people just boxing for example some people are even against it they think oh um, this promote uh, violence. Yeah, yeah. So it is what it is. It is Shushun. And before the internet came, this used to be a very closed circuit. When I first started this sport in, in the turn of the millennium, uh, it was at that time also a very closed society because I had to beg to enter this. Uh, and the internet was was only starting then I couldn't get a lot of information uh, I, I read the book uh, before that book I never heard of it I, I remember when I was very young maybe nine ten years old I can't remember but I was still in Hong Kong I was a child I was watching TV and there was a little show talking about the uh, dog training in Hong Kong and I saw some guy working a, a, a dog in the Shushun sleeve 
but at that time I didn't know what it was I just thought oh this guy had a, a tomato juice bag around his arm and let the dog bite but I saw this I said wow this is cool this is cool you can make a dog do this but maybe and other child sees this and says, oh, this is not good. I don't like it. So don't try to make this appealing for everybody. It, this is not for everybody. But if you want to do it, you will come into this world and you will try to get into it and to find the answer. So don't change the name. Uh, they have changed it. I can't, I can't say they can't. But for me, I have the freedom to call the transition name, the original name. For me, this is Shosun, and, so and that is the spirit for me. So protection sports, they start, compared to other sports, they are losing a little bit, time by time, the... Popularity. Uh, yes, exactly. Um, so, people in kennel clubs, uh, because of this uh, excuse, let's say, they are trying to bring a little bit, uh, to make these sports a little bit uh, less hard, or a little bit easier for the dogs and the handlers. And they have this idea that by this choice, more people will join the sports. What is your... So you agree with that or you disagree? I, I don't even think I have to give an opinion because when you look at the statistics, it proves that it doesn't work. Yes. They have been already doing this for at least 15 years and still you're lowering and lowering and lowering the level but still you cannot increase the popularity of the sports that means this is not the right direction yes. uh, um, I, I think to, to keep the popularity they have to just um, for, the, for the guys that are already in the sport, kennel clubs have to let them do. They have to let them do, they have to give them certain freedom. They cannot say, yeah, make popularity, but all the time changing the rules and lowering the levels. And, and the people that are already in the sport for decades, because they're lowering this uh, level or making some of the things very difficult, those guys leave, they leave. But meanwhile, you cannot attract new people to come in. So you, you leave, you're losing on both ends. Yes. So for you, it's, uh, it would be better to create a new sport or a different kind of discipline to, um, to bring new people in the sport instead of changing the sports uh, already existing. I, I believe, I, again, I talk, so for now, only for protection dog sport. Mm -hmm. I believe we have enough traditional protection dog sport. We have four. We have Belgian ring, we have French ring, we have KMPV, and we have Schussen, mm -hmm. or IPO, or to yes. next year they call it IGP. IGP. We have these four already. And all four of these sports, they have history, they have roots, they have culture, they have traditions, and they have a lot of value. And each one of these four sports, they have a lot of merits to develop, but also to preserve mm -hmm. the qualities of the working breeds. Um, so my opinion is work on first preserving these four um, programs, yes. these four sports. First, we preserve this. Uh, I have nothing against kennel clubs creating a new sport. But hey, don't forget what we have because there's a lot of value in this four sport and if in our generation or in the next generation or imagine um, last week or, or the week before 
we Christoph and I and, and um, some other friends, we went to a trial. Uh, and, and we met a friend and this friend said, ah, I'm reading your book now. And, and then Christoph says, hey, imagine 50 years later on, on a second hand uh, book stand, people see the book of Felix and they say, oh, wow, 50 years ago, they used to make the dog bites and they, were not, they don't know this and they're not aware of this. How sad that can be. How, how sad. Yes. So, it, it took so many years to, to develop the breeds and the quality and, and the technology we have in training and the tradition, but also the value and, and the honor uh, that we have in, in this culture. So we need first is what we have to do. We must preserve it. We must let the next generation and the generation after to appreciate this aid because even you have no dog spots, you need dogs for police, eh? Mm. You need dogs for military, you need dogs for, for searching um, for mines. Well, I think uh, that kennel clubs or uh, sport organizations, I think by time they have mixed a little bit uh, the origins of each sport and they have mixed uh, sport with uh, utility work and uh, breeding programs, you know, because let's say, for example, agility. I, I do also agility. Uh, that means I respect it for sure. But agility started as a sport. So it's not for a selection of uh, breeding or, uh, you know, something about that has, that has something to do with genetic qualities. Sutsun or Belgian Ring or KMPV, all these programs they first started to discriminate the quality of a, of a dog in genetic level. So I think that's why we shouldn't uh, treat them, all sports, in the same, uh, in the same mentality. Yes. You know? So I don't know if you agree with that. I agree. Thank you. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, we said a little bit about the sports, and, uh, but then it's about, because it's about mentality, it's also the way we train dogs, so it's not only about the regulations. This is, I think, it goes hand by hand with the, our ways of training and also the requirements our sports have, you know? So, if, for example, you do Schutzhund and uh, the judge comes and he says, Felix, you need a super hard dog, really fast and super obedient. Yes then there are no so many ways of moving uh, when you choose a method of training, you know? Yeah, or, or only a few dogs can do this uh, with, uh, for example, I own, if somebody, not me, yeah, if somebody uses only positive way of training and to achieve this uh, level of uh, IPO regulation, to achieve very, very uh, high ranking in this sport, Maybe somebody can do this with mostly positive systems, but I don't believe he can do this with many dogs. Maybe uh, uh, several dogs. Uh? So do you know anyone who did it? Do no. Positive? No, I me, don't. Me neither. No. And I don't know. But I keep an open mind, you know, yeah, I, because I haven't done it and uh, I cannot say this is not possible, but I haven't seen it. You know what? I think that it's not possible for one reason. Not because I, I'm a dogmatic person, but I think it's not possible because when there is environmental pressure, you know, at the competition, you cannot uh, handle uh, all situations. Eh? Then the dog will be pressed, stressed, you know? So when stress comes, then the dog feels uncomfortable. And when the dog feels uncomfortable, this means purely positive goes away. Yes. So, yeah. So, what is your opinion about uh, what is at the end abuse and what is uh, uh, welfare? You know, and we will go to another topic after. Yes. Abuse, welfare. This is a very wide discussion. Huh? Um, first of all, we are the human species, and if we talk about dogs dogs and other species. So 
uh, a lot of people, um, for example, a lot of pet dogs, the, the owners of pet dogs think they love the dogs. Uh, I have seen it, I'm sure you have seen it. A lot with small dogs because they're easy to be carried around. Uh. Some certain celebrities also uh, on TV, they, they carry a little dog in a handbag and walk around and the dog doesn't even have enough exercises because he's always being carried around. Uh. So, and they treat a, a dog like a child and um, oh, don't put him down because other dogs might hurt the, the, the little dog. Then in, in this dog owner's mind, they think they're giving the dog love, uh, they're caring for the dog, but is that really what that dog needs? Now, I, I came from uh, this background in biology, but you don't need to be a scientist to, to, to understand this. Now, most scientists, they agree that the domestic dog species, they came from wolf. Uh, and to, to I, I believe this hypothesis, because this is not 100% proven, but you can take a wild wolf, you take a domestic dog, you mate them, you have this wolf and dog hybrid. And this wolf and dog hybrid, you can mate this with another hybrid, it's fertile. You can mate this with a wolf, fertile. You can mate this with a dog, it's fertile. That means, in, at some point, they were one species. Huh? So I, I believe this hypothesis, hypothesis that the dogs we have today, many, many years ago, could be tens of thousands of year ago, years ago, they were wolves originally. And what are wolves? Social predators. So you look at some documentaries, you look at how wolves live in nature. They have a very strong structure, social structure, hierarchy, and I believe if you want to train a dog and love the way, love him the way that he should be loved and looked after, you have to follow this. And if you go against this, then I wouldn't say it's abuse, but you are working against the natural instincts of the animal. So, so, so back to your question, uh, I, I, because I don't want to avoid it, uh, I want to confront it. What is abuse? Okay, let's go back to nature. A pack of wolves. If certain wolf is out of line, or he wants to challenge the alpha, sometimes the alpha would use force to put this wolf back into his ranking. And that force he uses, and again, look at some documentaries, there are a lot of them. The force he uses must be um, must go according what that subordinate wolf needs. So if he goes so much that he kills a wolf, then of course in their world that is abuse. Huh? But if he, if he bites a wolf and, and that wolf uh, has pain, but he goes back to his place, then I think he's just doing his job as the alpha. And for me, that is not abuse. And if we put this context back into the human world, how people should train and handle their dogs, I believe we, anyway, I try to follow this rule. But if you, you don't need the documentaries even for that. I mean, I use this often. When you pass by a road and you cross the red light, police stops you and you say, they say 1,000 euro fine. What do you feel? You feel nice? That's negative reinforcement. Exactly. Eh? So is that abuse? No. Not at all. Why? Because there is a reason and pressure is the way of keeping an order in a social path, you know, so that no, uh, so that no one uh, just expresses his instincts or his feelings all the time. Because then the structure collapses and then the benefits of a pack or a family or a society are not there because there is no society anymore. Yes. So I think if, even if we look at now in our world, we get these uh, answers. Put it this way, yeah? uh, a lot of people um, so-called the 
animal welfare people, they say that animals should be treated humanely. Of course, I believe that, but what is humanely? And some people go to the extreme, they say, oh, when we interact with animals, we must not use anything that is negative. Huh? But this is not normal because this doesn't even work in the human world and we, the human species, we are supposed to be the high species on this planet. And just look at all the countries, almost all the nations, they have prisons. So that means it doesn't work because if this animal welfare people, what they believe is correct, everything positive, 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 we wouldn't have prisons. Prisons wouldn't exist. But the planet is full of prisons. So how do you explain this? And, uh, in, and with the species that it's lower in yeah. mental uh, power than... Capacity. Yes. Yeah. So, um, what I wanted to ask, and I, I guess, guess that uh, it was a big uh, chapter in your life, this. Uh, so before some years, 2013 or some or 15? The, the, that event happened in 2011. In 11. Uh, but the video was... Uh, 2015. 15. So... Uh, Maybe you give a little background to the yes, viewers. Yes. So, uh, if you are a dog world, you may know, uh, but uh, at some point, at 2015, I think, there was a video online um, from a training uh, with Felix that... Uh, a video that it was really uh, hardly, uh, really hard criticized from many dog trainers and also welfare people. And, yes, um, that uh, there was a dog and uh, uh, Felix was using force to bring him in line. Um, so my first question was, is because I don't know you. I mean, now I'm <laughs> now we met. Uh, so I cannot have a clear image about what was happening. So what was this about this video and uh, what was happening back, back then? So the, the short background uh, about this event was in that year 2011, I was invited to give a seminar in China, which I get invited every year since 2005. Mm -hmm. uh. So uh, a, a dog, over there with an IPO free title, uh, a, a trained dog and with temperament. Uh, he went to the new owners and these new owners could not handle him. And they, two of them, they got beaten and they were hospitalized. So when I arrived in, in this seminar, they brought the dog and they asked me to, to try to solve this problem for them. And I had about one week, I think, and um, in the first few days, I try first to use positive approaches with the clicker and also try to reward the dog. But uh, it wouldn't work. Um, not consistent and clearly because the two guys, two, the, the two handlers, they were already beaten by him and not just a kiss, beaten, beaten. Eh? So it is understandable they were a bit afraid of the dog. So I saw this and I spoke to the, the, the boss of these uh, two handlers. He owned the dog. So I said, what do you want me to do? Uh, going this way, I will not be able to fix it. He said, do whatever you have to do. Huh? So in one training uh, session in this seminar, uh, this dog came into the hide, and it's an IPO free dog. Uh, he knows all the exercises. But because he, he was so unruly, he just came in and beat the sleeve uh, instead of barking. Uh, so at that time, for me, that was the moment for me to step in and take over and use this opportunity to put him back in line. So I went quite hard, uh, very physical with the dog, a lot of shouting also, and then it, it went on for about one minute. And then I put the dog back in line. I told him to bite, he bit like this. I sat out, boom, he out like this. I worked a little bit further, and the dog was again back into the correct behavior, biting good and outing good. And then we, we completed the exercise this way. So um, I worked him 
in several sessions like this with force and I could manage the dog. Uh, I could manage the dog. The dog never had problem with me. But I, I try to bring this to the two students of mine. Uh, but then after this, how I handled him, I solved the problem. I had the correct relationship with this dog. But when they took over again, I saw that, yeah, they, they have some kind of, uh, the, the boys, they, they had yeah. some kind of um, a phobia then uh, with this dog. So I understood it. So I, at the end of the seminar, I said, okay, I put him in line, but I don't think uh, it would be wise for you guys after I'm gone to continue with him because I'm not around and you don't have enough experience. So now the boss, me, is gone. So maybe he will do something out of line again. And then if the dog comes back, he will be even more brutal uh, in, in the attack. So I said to them, just leave him alone. You imported him as a, as a stud dog. Let him be, let him produce the good dogs in, in China. And they took my advice and it was like this. And I didn't put the, that video online because back in those days uh, in, in China, people were filming a lot. And also I had nothing to hide. And in that time, in that place, in that situation, all the students, there were about 60 guys watching me, they knew what happened all the way. They saw how the aggressive, holy mother, the holy yeah, they, they saw how aggressive, a little bit dangerous, uh, how, how bad it was at the very beginning. And I did what I had to do to control the situation. So some of them after the seminar, they put a piece of the video uh, online to, to explain the situation in my favor. They said, yeah, this dog was like this and Felix did this to, to um, try to solve the problem and at the end it was good. So uh, the people in, in this seminar, they were happy. But then in 2015, I was asked to go to Hong Kong. To so many years after. Many years after, uh, four years after. I was asked to go to Hong Kong to, that is my homeland, uh, to develop Shushun, this sport. And just then, this video was uh, put on Facebook and, and on YouTube. And then, uh, of course, uh, a lot of people did not understand what I was doing and, and a piece of this was taken out. So I was, uh, I, I had very bad publicity for, for about six months. So, so you say it was on purpose, so they, they published it back then? Listen, uh, I don't want to, I take responsibility of what I did. Uh? Now, if you ask me, hey, Felix, we have now exactly the sa same situation with a dog like this, what would you do? Okay, because of this lesson I have learned, I, will, I can tell you what to do verbally, uh, but you also have to tell me how much time you have, what technology you have, um, how much experience you have. I will try to give my advice to you what to do, but if I have to... Uh, use force on this dog again just because this is your problem or oh, with you I will help eh? because I understand you but let's say someone that has no clue about a dog uh, I give my verbal advice but now I would not step in with my hands and take over because after some years this can come back and bite me on the ass yeah. so uh, so by that time, uh, when the video was published, and also it was published uh, and shared, to be more precise, uh, also from uh, well-known uh, dog uh, sport people. Yeah. In my opinion, and it's only my opinion, uh, I think this is a really hypocritic from them. But yes. Uh, so tell me, how was the period after the video? Like you are building up your career in dog sports, and um, every dog trainer knows that there are two ways of harming his uh, career. One is that uh, he's not successful, so he's not a good trainer. 
And the other way is that uh, someone is blame, blaming him for uh, animal mistreatment or abuse. So yes. it's, I, I guess it was a really hard uh, thing to I, I had that. both ways. Yes, yes. yes. So for, me, for this and from before so also. Tell me, how, how was the period after that? And uh, how did you manage to recover? And uh, also, what was the, how to say, the behavior of other trainers or did you have support or not or yeah so of course that was not a picnic uh, that was not fun at all uh, my career was almost destroyed because of that um, I got uh, telephone calls and emails and messengers uh, messages on social media death threat even against me and my family they had nothing to do with this uh, I got this for several months yeah? and uh, when I went to a dog club in Belgium I entered the door and the people some of them most of them I knew they saw that I enter they turned their back and they were whispering yeah? so it, in, in that few months it was not fun for me to go anywhere in, in this uh, circuit uh. so and, and before that I was writing a book uh, I was writing this book uh, I started it but I was a little bit lazy I, I never uh, put a lot of effort to complete it so when I had this bad period at the end of 2015 I thought oh when I go out, people hate me anyway. It's, uh, it's not so good to show my face. Uh. So, and I, I was doing nothing at home anyway. I, I got several seminars cancelled because of this. So I said, okay, I sit at home in front of my computer and now I will finish this book. I will complete this book. So from, that was from August 2015 until the very end of 2015 December the last day of December that three months I spent every day at home writing 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 and this book is like uh, 360 pages and it was that three months that gave me the motivation to finish this so in that time that's what I did and then the book was published uh, it was a hit so I kind of climb back out from the hole. Nice. And uh, did you have people uh, uh, by your side or...? I, I had uh, a lot of people that um, jump on the bandwagon to, to say that yeah, he's an abuser and, and uh, he mistreats animals and he's like that. I had uh, people that were strangers, they contacted me by email and by, by telephone they wanted to know what happened what happened before they make their judgment so I explained to them that was what happened like what I just explained here and um, some of them still said eh, you're an abuser uh, and stop the contact but some of them then after my explanation they told me yeah I, I have been there I have been in this situation I understand and of course in a situation like this then you find out who your real friends are and I'm lucky because I still have a lot of friends that stood up for me that defended me and that supported me yeah now the in the modern society especially with social media with the internet and with smartphones um, a lot of things that were normal 30 years ago now it is so easy to take out a smartphone and, put, and, and film this and put it online and let the world see it um, sometimes it can be misunderstood by some people uh, some of the photos or videos it, it doesn't matter what it, it doesn't have to be uh, something to do with dogs or animals just anything um, people seem to get emotional 
uh, very quickly, they make their judgment without thinking, you know, what is behind this. And a lot of uh, things have been sensationalized. They, they are put there to provoke certain emotion with people. It, it could be advertisement. Uh, it, it could be um, certain agenda. So, for example, uh, when I train a dog, I use different tools. I, I use positive and I use negative also. I try to keep an open mind. I use whatever tool that I think, that I believe would work best for a dog. Working best for a dog, meaning the dog, through using this system or using this tool, I can make the dog understand what I want very quickly. But at the same time, I can have consistent result. Uh, that means I do certain things, he does it today very quickly, but tomorrow he doesn't do it. Or, and the day after he doesn't do it, then it's not consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want something that the dog can understand it very quickly, but a consistent result. Mm -hmm. And I keep an open mind for that, be it the clicker or the teletech. And this, with this, I want to add something. Uh, a lot of people give this two uh, mm -hmm. different names. They now, they call them. Yeah, so this is something I, I bought online just for demonstration. Mm -hmm. It gives no electric stimulation. It gives only sound, light, and vibration. So uh, a lot of people, uh, this is sound, vibration, different level of vibration it gives, and, uh, and a little light. So this is something that um, I just started to use it, not for the dogs, but for education with my students. Um, because this tool has many names, the electric collar, uh, remote trainer, teletech, I prefer to call it teletech, why? It has a meaning. Television, telegram, telephone, tele means distance, over a long distance. Tech, contact. So this tool, for me, it means distance, contact. That means I can touch my dog, not to hurt my dog, but I can touch my dog or give him a signal over a long distance. So in a way, this is like an invisible leash. Yes. And it is very important um, we are already in this society, in this circuit. So you know how to use it. I know how to use it. But it is important for, for us, for dog trainers, to explain to the general public why we are using this and how we are using this and what we use this for. Um, what are the benefits and the dangers of this? So, imagine a, a, a normal pet owner with a little Pomeranian. He cannot relate to the pinch collar because his dog is like five pounds and when he takes his dog for a walk, even though the dog is pulling like crazy, he's strong enough to hold him and, and he will not uh, have to spend a lot of energy trying to control the dog because it's a little dog. Or he, he, he can bark and act very aggressively and bite people and because the dog is so small, it doesn't matter. And when I used to handle a lot of pet dogs, I, I trained a lot of that type. You also. Uh? So for those dogs, even they're out of control because they're not dangerous and they're not so strong, people tend to be uh, very for forgiving for them. But I would like those dog owners to put themselves in the shoes of other dog lovers, not dog trainers, uh, other dog lovers that have dogs that are very big. For example, in Greece, there are a lot of Caucasian of chakras, and these dogs are like 80, 80 kilograms. Yeah, yeah. So a dog like this, you cannot treat him like a little Pomeranian, because if he pulls, he's very strong. Uh, if he bites, he can do a lot of harm, he can do a lot of damage to someone. 
and it is not always possible to use only positive reinforcement to train or to control mm -hmm. such animal. So um, sometimes you have the social media, you have uh, the general public, you have politicians. They say, oh, you cannot use this. You cannot use this uh, uh, electric collar or teletech. You cannot use the pinch collar. You cannot do this. You cannot do that. Because uh, with these tools, you can hurt the dog. But come on, if someone really wants to hurt a dog, he can, he can take a glass and throw it at the dog and, and hurt him. So, um, then do you ban people from using a glass, drinking from a glass? Or you can say, hey, people can, can use a, a knife to hurt the dog. Oh, then from now on, ban all knives. So when does this stop? So I believe the, the, the right way, the direction that society should go is not to ban this, ban that, stop this and stop that, is to show really how to use it and the correct way to use it. Um, if you use it correctly, it, it is just like a leash. For example, with these two, it gives only sound and vibration. It is the same as a smartphone. It rings, it gives sound and vibration. So that is only a signal for the dog. It doesn't hurt him. But with this, you can control the dog. And with some dogs, of course, you need electric stimulation, but it doesn't mean you press the button and the dog is shocked and he's jumping up. You can give very low stimulation, feels just like this, it's only a signal. But of course, then it goes very deep into technical stuff. Uh, if I talk about this, we yes, talked yes. just two days and yes, yes. Uh, we could not cover everything. Yes. Yeah. But an and open mind, that is very important. And I, as I told you the days before, when I made my first steps in dog training, I was li really furious, you know? You were an extremist when, against yeah, this, yeah. Eh? I, was, I was really an extremist, you know? Why? Because when I, I've heard the word of uh, electric collar, I was like, yeah. who... You have who this is? image yeah. in your head. I have a, I, my image was a US prison uh, with electric chair. Yes. This was my impression, you know? Yes. And then when I saw professionals using it correctly and I saw the results in dogs, so when I saw happy dogs with tails up and really expression, expression in, you know, work, I felt such an idiot, you know. Why? Because I had a judgment about something I, that, that I haven't even saw. So I think in, uh, in any case you have to, if you want to be honest with yourself and if you want to be productive, uh, when you are making a judgment or you criticize something, I think first you have to see the use of your. You have to do a little bit of research first. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So why I was doing this? But me personally, because I was ignorant, you know. And also I had this flame of knowing everything because I was younger. But uh, yeah, experience shows that it's not like yes. that. Yes. What do you think, like? Uh, with all these regulations from the kennel clubs and the dog sports and the um, tools or ways of training. I mean, what do you think that dog sport will be in the future? So there are two um, issues that I think all dog sporters are confronting at the moment, the breathing and the training. Now the breathing, um, Certain organizations, they make a lot of rules about breathing. Dogs have to be so tall and the eyes have to be certain colors and the dog has to be certain shape. But this kind of so-called standard, it changes all the time. Huh? And um, people always, uh, the, the, the rule makers always come up with reasons why they're changing the, the standards. Uh, but really, uh, they, they, they give their reasons. The reasons is, oh, the dog with this structure, they can run better, they can jump better. But for me, if I want to see if a dog can jump, give a hurdle, one meter or 120. If he can jump over this consistently, he has the structure for jumping. 
Um, also, people like to label dogs, they like to label breeds. Oh, this is a German Shepherd, this is a Rottweiler, this is a Malinois. They are purebred dogs. Hey, purebred dogs, don't forget most of the breeds, they have a history of mixing. Yeah, uh, about 100 years. And before they were uh, put into these standards, they were all crossbreeds. So the, the word, the, the phrase uh, pure breed, that is a vague idea. And even you have, you have two dogs, for example, Rottweilers. Uh, you take the beauty champion, black and tan, everything is within the beauty standard. You take another female, the same. You put them together, they still have sometimes white and teeth like this. So what does that tell you? This, this genes, this kind of standard is not stable, it changes. You cannot fix this. Huh? And by trying to put the dogs in this, box. in this box, we kill off the breed. Um, you make the gene pool smaller and smaller and smaller. And I don't think that is wise. I, in this sense, I respect the Hollanders a lot, the Dutch people a lot, because they have the KMPV program, and they don't care so much about the so-called purebred dogs. Sometimes they mix the Malinois with a Dutch Shepherd or with a German Shepherd and with other breeds, and the dogs that can do the work, they're the good dogs. They have so, good health and... Uh... Yeah, yeah, so I think that's, that's a great idea. Some organizations, they are already following uh, this system, I think, that is the way to go. And regarded, regarding to training, um, like I said before, all these rules making certain things very harsh, like banning the use of teletech or the pinch collar. But meanwhile, you're lowering the standard of the sport. The jump is lower, the exercises uh, uh, easier. I don't think... Um, that is the right direction to preserve what we have. For example, our sport uh, in Schussmann, in IPO, they make the regulations that in, the, in tracking, the dog has to search with a lot of precision, very calm, with a good attitude, okay. In obedience, the dog has to work with great uh, attitude with the head up, focus like this, and the tail like this, very high in speed, okay. In protection, we want the dog to be very energetic, full of life, and very fast in the, in the attack. Uh, and at the same time, absolute control. So, the demand is very higher, the criteria are very higher, this is like, um, I say to you, Sotiris, now I want you to make me the best uh, lamb grill, uh, this uh, dish of food. The best, it has to be this tasty with this spice and it has to be grilled 80% uh, uh, cooked, something like this. Okay, but then meanwhile, the kennel clubs, they say, oh, but to achieve all these uh, criteria, you cannot use the pinch collar, you, can use, you, can, you cannot use the teletech, you cannot use this, you cannot use that. Then this is like me telling you, make this lamb grill, this dish, you cannot use fire. So... That's a good hypocrisy. Yeah, it ends up like that. So you, so win, uh, you want that the sport have uh, this... Spectacular image for the people, you know, and the spectators. But then, on the other hand, you are lower, uh, you are pretending that... Like, like what my friend Christoph always says, if you want to cook spaghetti, you need to boil the water. Yes. And if I am, uh, let's say, I make pottery, uh, I, I take some clay and I want to make a pot. I make this pot out of clay. If I want this pot to form the shape, I have to put this in an oven and I put heat to make it form the shape. Mm -hmm. Only through this shaping and 
in the oven under this heat, I can complete this pot. So now some organizations, they say, oh, just make this clay. Uh, you cannot use the oven. And then you pour water in and yes. it, it breaks. So it's something for us to think yes. about. Yes. Many people in dog sports, uh, they have this uh, thinking and uh, this, uh, uh, they trouble their minds with that, you know, where we are going and uh, how this will end up and if it's worth all this, what we are doing for the dogs and uh, for the health of them, which is really important. Um, so many of them, they, they are really talking about creating a new association or something that it stays like the Dutch people do, you know. So stays for the real reason of a working dog. So you need a healthy dog in mental and in uh, body structure, and that's it. So what what is your thinking about that? I think that's a brilliant idea. Um, I believe anything that has to do with working dog breeds in the breeding and in the training. The people that govern this, they have to be real breeders or trainers that understand the dogs. They cannot be... Politicians. Yeah, they cannot, they, they must know what they're talking about. And if they make certain regulations, they must do this for the breed and for the training to preserve what we have. That is very important because if we don't preserve this, then everything, all the work that our ancestors or the people before us, all the great dog people, all their work will be lost if we don't protect it. So talking about the future, um, tell us a little bit about your plans about it. So where you want to be in the next years? So, I started with the Malinois, I'm back with the Malinois, but in fact, I never left the Malinois because since I had Malinois, I, even when I was training Sherman Shepherds and, and Rottweilers and I helped my friends to train other breeds, I always still have Malinois all through my career. So, um, I told you at the moment I'm working with three young dogs and in two sports in in, Schussen, in IPO and in Belgian ring. Uh, I would like to have fun in the training and go far with them. Now, everybody, every serious competitor, the ultimate goal, of course, is to winning the world championship title. Of course, that is one of my goals also. Um, but meanwhile, I like to, I like to do this together with like-minded people, um, and um, because if if our sport is, it is already a small world, uh, and um, it will be more fun. Of course, if we want newcomers, they have to come in with the correct mentality, not people coming in with the wrong. Uh, image about the sport, uh, the correct mentality, and, and that's why I, I, I wrote this book, uh, and, and now the second one is coming out, it's being published at the moment. So, I, I have several goals, one is for me, I, I want to do well in the competitive world, in the sport, and other goal is to, to share a little bit what I know with like-minded people or people that are interested, in this sport and in the working breeds. So, yeah, that's what I do. And, and for the next 10 years, I'll be doing this. Nice. Um, so for people to know, uh, you have published the uh, Sutskun Training Manual. Yes. In my opinion, one of the best books of, uh, around uh, uh, Sutskun. Thank you. Um, you said uh, you're about to publish the second one. Yes. Uh, when do you know when this will be? I, I have written everything, uh, all the photos have been taken, now it is with my publisher. Mm -hmm. So I wrote first in, in Chinese because with, with this one I also first wrote in Chinese. 
Yes. Are you expecting this in the next month? The Chinese version very soon in a few months and uh, it, it's a lot of work. This, this one I told you is 360 pages. The, the second menu, it will be about 500 pages or over. Uh, so it was a lot of work and uh, now I'm sort of taking a break. Um, in a few weeks time I will start again and then I will write this menu too in English. Uh, this one is already in two languages, Chinese and English. And then menu two, Chinese version is done and I will write it also in English. And you also give seminars around the world? Yes, like yes. so far I have done about 30, 40 seminars around the world. Nice. And yeah. uh, the seminar the, in the past few days uh, I certainly uh, uh, propose to people to watch uh, one of uh, Felix's seminars. It was Thank really you. informative. Thank you. I really, I really, I really like, and that was one of the reasons I invited you. You, I really like uh, people that they have a system and a structure in their training. You Thank know? you. Um, so, um, people that they are interested into buying his books or watch his news or whatever, they can find the information in the section uh, below uh, the video. Uh, like links from your website or yes and also if you want to support the project of interviewing the dog world you can also subscribe to to our channel i love so, your interviews i always watch them thank you very much thank you so felix really thank you really for nice having to me meet you and uh, consider you have a friend in greece for sure thank you have a nice trip back yes come to belgium and see me sometime soon yes it's in the plan yes okay see you Surfing. That's all we wanna do.